Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for meeting us over your lunch hour. Um, I'm going to take the first five minutes to talk to you about our animal imaging core here on campus. Uh, some of you have maybe worked with us already, um, or some of you may in the future. Um, so kind of go over what we do. Um, as far as our team goes, uh, our, our core director is Dr. Natalie Serkova here in the front row. Um, I am the animal imaging core manager. So I kind of oversee all operations. Um, Elena, she's in the third row over here. Uh, she is one of our core technicians, uh, mainly CT and NMR, but also all over the place, um, helping us with whatever we need. And then Melissa Card, uh, she is part of the OLAR group um, down in the vivarium, but we work very closely with her and the rest of the OLAR team. So um, that we put up a representative um, uh, staff member for that. Um, for the equipment that we have within our core, uh, we have our 9.4 Tesla MRI. Um, it was newly installed la last year. Last year, yes. Okay, 2020. Um, it's awesome. Uh, we're doing lots of great studies with it, and we're very excited to have it. Um, we have a, a Siemens Invion PET CT, so micro PET CT. Um, we have a optical imaging scanner. It's the IVIS 200. Can't see. <laughs> and then, um, as I mentioned before, we do uh, NMR work as well, um, working with the School of Pharmacy and their NMR magnet. And uh, within our MRI suite, we have the um, irradiator, um, the precision guided irradiator. And that is uh, over, overseen by Dr. Sana Karam and Ben Vancourt, um, but we also work very closely with them. Our services are um, very, uh, I guess, um, from start to finish, uh, we get you started with your study design. Um, if you have any questions about IACUC or SOPs, um, we uh, get you ready to um, send your IACUC up to, uh, your IACUC protocol up to IACUC to get approved. Um, we also help with iLab scheduling. Um, so getting you set up um, to either schedule your own uh, uh, studies or um, work with us um, to schedule your studies if it's um, something that we're scanning for you. Uh, we do all animal handling um, for MRI, PET CT, um, and then um, we also uh, work with you if you have new contrast agents or um, want to do any research with that. Um, again, um, protocol development. Um, so once you are approved for that iCook and you are able to get started, um, we work with you uh, to develop a protocol that's um, suited for your study. And um, if that is, you know, part of imaging, um, as far as scanning, we usually give new users a um, two-hour um, uh, I guess freebie um, just to get you started. Um, we do all image acquisition for MRI and PET-CT, and um, then the IVIS is self-ran. That's um, We'll kind of go into that a little bit later. Um, we will also perform image analysis, um, new user training. Um, that's for IVIS. Uh, we conduct imaging workshops um, once a year. And um, we're actually doing one in um, CSU as well, so kind of uh, twice a year, um, if you want to consider that. Um, we help with grants, publications, and reports as well, if you need um, verbiage for that. Um, to go in more depth with our optical imaging scanner, scanner it is an IVIS 200. Um, it is an older model, um, but we just found out that we were awarded um, a, our um, shared instrumentation grant for an upgraded system. So um, we'll be expecting that this spring. Um, but uh, you can, um, this is probably our, our biggest um, instrument as far as user base. Um, so you have a, uh, a cell 
um, that you want to track, and then um, depending on your uh, tag, uh, tagging or reporting, uh, the, the scanner will detect signal from that, and you can, um, uh, you can follow your signal from the start of your study to the end, um, you know, just depending on what you have going on. Um, for our MRI, uh, there's some images of our old uh, scanner and then of our new scanner, so you can see it's significantly improved. Um, we just love it. Uh, we've done lots of awesome studies with it so far, and um, we continue to get new ideas coming through as well. Um, for micro CT, we do everything from um, whole body mice uh, to um, parts of rats, um, guinea pig knees, uh, lungs, and then we also do um, phantom uh, phantom scanning as well, or any sort of gadget that um, someone presents us with. Um, pet. Um, we mainly work with FDG, um, the F-18 right now. Um, and again, we um, are more than happy to work with you to, to determine, um, you know, what fits best with your study if you're interested in that. And that's our imaging core in a nutshell. So I don't know. I can take questions if anyone has questions. Otherwise, I'll um, hand it over to Dr. DeLeal. No? Okay. Thank you, Jenna. So this was our uh, shared resource uh, pitch uh, for the animal imaging this this today this time, and we're going to uh, listen now to uh, Dr. Alex Delil talk. And um, actually, Alex is teaching our workshops quite intensively. It's what Jenna mentioned. Um, Alex. Um, graduated with honors as a veterinarian at the University of Ghent, Belgium, and she completed a PhD program at our CSU studying the bovine clone placenta. <clears throat> wow. Uh, for her postdoctoral research uh, uh, studies, she investigated drug delivery using various in vivo imaging modalities at the CSU Animal Cancer Center in collaboration with our pharmacology department here. And I first time met uh, Alex when she was actually teaching us how to properly to do IVs and bioluminescence. Alex, Dr. Ladelil was with Perkin Elmer Zinogen for over 15 years. And most recently, she expanded her expertise further. And um, she joined the Sanova as the vice president of application and product strategy. And Sanova is the company who makes the new ultra, uh, very novel ultrasound slash bioluminescent systems for animal imaging. Alex has a lot of publication in the area of molecular imaging, and actually we're just preparing um, a joint publication together. So the reason why I'm very interested in Alex's talk is that we do have a sophisticated uh, cardiovascular ultrasound uh, facility, which Maria is, uh, is right there, so she is, she is doing a great job. But sometimes for the animal imaging, we need just something fast and uh, also sometimes even like a cell front, almost like Ivis. And I think because it also has a bioluminescence, this technology represents a really very interesting niche for us, for our cancer center animal imaging course. So actually, I will be in touch with you to afterwards just to see if we need to bring this technology for orthotopic injection of the, of the tumors or fast assessment of the tumor growth or vascularity. So uh, yeah, with this, I just give the microphone to Dr. Delil. Thank you, Dr. Sokova. Let's see, can everybody hear me? Yes, perfect. 
So first of all, I would like to thank the core, Dr. Serkova, her colleagues, as well as Dr. Katerina Hopp, for inviting me to, uh, to present to you today about a novel technology, which is known as robotic ultrasound. And so I will present you with an int uh, introduction to the Vega, in uh, the Vega instrument from a company called Sonoval. Sonoval is a startup company and it is a spin-off from Paul Dayton's lab at uh, UNC in the Research Triangle in North Carolina. And um, we actually have two instruments. One is the Vega, which is ultrasound only. And then we have another instrument under development, which is called the Strata. And the Strata is a combined ultrasound and bioluminescence. And I'll show you a sneak peek of that at the end of the presentation. Um, so here you can see the instrument, and clearly it is developed to facilitate drug discovery and life science uh, research. So the overview of the presentation, um, we will also send you a PDF of the presentation with the slides, so you don't need to frantically take notes. And uh, Dr. Serkova will send that out. Plus, I understand the meeting is recorded as well, so you can always have um, a replay. And initially, I will introduce the instrument because people are a little mesmerized. How can you do ultrasound without holding a probe? So it's pretty cool technology from an engineering perspective. Um, at the company, it's kind of interesting. We're 13 people. Um, the oldest one besides me is 35 years old, and they're all guys. So I'm the only girl, and I'm 15 years older than them. So <laughs> go figure. It's a lot of fun. Um, we will talk through oncology research applications, and, um, and very straightforward application is tumor volume. We'll also look at um, tumor vascularity, and then uh, I'll briefly introduce you to other capabilities of the instrument. So um, the approach of Sonoval is to make ultrasound imaging easy. Traditionally, when we think about ultrasound, we think about a pregnant mom that gets a scan to look at the baby, right? And so here you have the patient, and you have the professional sonographer that's holding a transducer and taking the scan of the baby that can be seen in the background on the monitor. Of course, for us in the preclinical pre uh, research arena, we don't scan women, we scan mice, right? <laughs> So this one is pretty cute. It's a super mouse. And anyhow, but the, the, the problem with ultrasonography, I mean, the beauty is, is you get good soft tissue resolution without needing to inject a contrast agent. However, the gold standard for soft tissue imaging is clearly MRI, right? <laughs> but um, so the whole idea of this technology is how can we make it easier, less expensive, more high throughput? So. Another hurdle besides cost resolution is the need for a highly technical skilled sonographer because you really need to know how to hold the probe, how to position it, which angles to take, this and that. So our CEO, Dr. Ryan Gessner, he was like, there has to be a way to make this easier. So he came up with a concept of having a Xerox copier for mice based on ultrasound. So that's basically the idea. Well, it's still not quite a Xerox copier because we still have to put the mice down, etc. cetera. But um, yeah, this is the instrument you get. And so it's an orange box. Our CEO is colorblind. <laughs> we give him a hard time about orange. But apparently orange is a color for North, uh, Northern uh, Carolina. Anyhow, so it's a robotic ultrasound. There's no handheld probe. As you see on the outside of the, this box, there's no probe to be found. It's actually hiding inside the orange chamber. And I'll show you a picture of the inside in just a minute. A, a great advantage of this technology is the way we scan. We get a wide field of view, which allows us to scan the entire animal and re reconstruct the scans in 3D. Clearly, it's ultrasound. There's no radiation. Sometimes people think, oh, this is a micro-CT, but it's not. And we have relatively high resolution. 
not to compare to the 9.4 Tesla MRI. <laughs> but um, the great advantage is, is just like um, you're used to operating the IVIS yourself, you can operate this instrument yourself. You don't need to have um, training to uh, scan your mice and analyze the data. So it ends up being about 10 times faster than conventional ultrasound and MRI. And clearly there's no dedicated technician required because now um, a scan with MRI takes a bit longer. You have to align the technician. You have to align availability of the instrument, et cetera, et cetera. So we're trying to eliminate that problem. Um, another great advantage is this is a relatively... Hold on. Um, it's small, so it fits on a bench top. You could actually install it here on the podium. And then um, lastly, it's not just a single application. It's not just imaging tumors. It's really a platform technology that allows to obtain anatomical and functional imaging. We can look, for example, at left ventricle function of the heart. And then, of course, if we combine it with bioluminescence imaging, we can co-register with molecular imaging as well. So this is actually how easy it is to stage the mice. What do you see here? So there's like three little slots. We can image three mice at a time. And the mice are posed on an acoustic membrane. And the acoustic membrane is the interface between the mouse and then the transducer underneath in the chamber. And traditionally what we do is A, we um, immobilize the mice with anesthesia. We have isofluorine gas because it's easy, but some people prefer other, um, other uh, uh, anesthesia methods such as injectables. Um, and then, of course, so we can stage three mice. One important criterion is, as with all ultrasound, is you do need to remove the hair of the mouse because the hair interferes with the sound waves. So this is a nude mouse, so no problem. However, um, let's say you're interested in scanning the liver of the mouse, you will basically um, clip a patch on the belly of the mouse. So do keep that in mind that you still need to um, remove the hair. And so um, you can put three mice down at a time. Um, Position-wise, you can put them down supine, prone, or lateral, depending on where you want to image. And this is, again, something kind of similar with the IVIS, where you want to have the light closer to the, to the camera. So positional effects um, do matter because depending on the frequency of the probe, the higher the frequency, the lower the depth penetration. So ideally you want to have, the, if you're imaging the liver, you want to have the mouse belly down. You're doing the kidneys, you want to put the mouse belly up. And um, what we do to seal the contact between the membrane and the animal is we put um, a couple of milliliters of warm water down. You can, of course, use gel as well, but gel is messy, can have bubbles that interfere with the signal, etc. So we find that 95% of the time we don't need gel. And let's see, what else can I say? Yeah, so the membrane is about three by five inches, so we can do small rats as well, so as long as it fits on the membrane. And then, of course, we could make those slots bigger for larger animals, but then you have different probe requirements. And the probes we have, the two probes that we have now, they actually are optimized for mice and small rats. Okay. Now, this is what's inside, right? What's inside that magical box? Well, it's actually oil-filled, and it holds a, let's see where I can point to that, it holds a carriage, and this carriage is robotically controlled and can move on an X, Y axis. And that carriage is what holds the transducers. And so we can put two, three, four transducers on that carriage. Right now, most often, people have either one or two. And we have a wobbler. The wobbler has the higher frequency but lower frame rate. And then we have a linear array, which has a lower frequency but a higher frame rate. And so, tossing it back and forth, you can have one or the other. Like, we have some groups, and such as Katharina's hops groups. She's very interested in kidney disease. The wobbler would just be plenty sufficient for her. Um, okay. So then, 
one important feature that the instrument also has is this camera. There is a camera here on top of the box that basically scans the field of view and allows you to also capture smaller or larger fields of view regions of interest for each particular mouse. So the smaller your region of interest, the faster the scan. Let's say you only want to do the heart, you're just going to draw a little region of interest around the heart. Let's say you want to do the whole body cavity of the mouse, then you take a slightly larger ROI. And then, so the transducer is underneath the acoustic membrane. The mouse is on the acoustic membrane. And then, based on the settings of your ROI, your scanner will take these parallel images that are iteratively collected within a set ROI. So basically what happens is, is the transducer captures images and, and XY images along the axis of the mouse. And then we Z-stack them, and that's how we create the 3D volume. And then each mouse is uh, imaged sequentially. So you could see number one is scanned, then number two, number three. Traditionally, um, scans are less than one minute per animal. And the nice thing is since it's open, there's no box. Of course, with the optical component, there is a box. But in the Vega, there's no box. So once you're done with number one, you can put mouse number four down. So you can work really fast. And then this actually shows you again the concept of creating the 3D volume of the mouse. So basically the um, probe moves underneath the mouse and takes one or two scan paths, depending on how wide the mouse is. We can do three as well if we have a rat. And these scan paths overlap. And so those are X, Y images that and the probe moves along the, uh, uh, the axis of the mouse. So we can Z-stack them and create that 3D volume. And then this is the result you get, is you get a complete reconstruction of your mouse, and you can scroll through the three planes, the actual plane, the transversal plane, and then the coronal plane. And so you immediately can identify the spine. You can see there's a tumor here. You can see the kidneys. So anatomical landmarks are easily identifiable. And the, the screen doesn't show you the best resolution, but you can come and look at my uh, computer afterwards. And then so you obtain detailed anatomy. Just once you collect your scan, it automatically reconstructs in a matter of seconds. And so you can look at your whole mouse this is a coronal plane. We immediately can identify the kidneys, the tumors, the adrenal gland, the liver. Of course, for the liver, you'd rather flip-flop your mouse. Um, the stomach, the spleen, the sacrum, tail. Yeah, vertebrae, of course. So a great advantage of the technology is definitely the throughput. The fact that you can put three mice, um, stage three mice at a time. And um, this is a quote from a staff scientist um, in an immuno-oncology company, and they scan about 50 mice in two hours. Um, In-house, we just ran a study with, let's see, eight cages, five mice, so 40 mice for a liver study, and we could scan all 40 mice in just under an hour. So, of course, it depends on your application, but that gives you an idea of throughput. <laughs> And so applications where we're uh, quite well received is kidney imaging, liver imaging, tumor imaging, cardiovascular, regeneration, tissue regeneration, and then reproduction. So we can see the little babies in, in the pregnant mouse and rat. And of course, it's anatomical imaging is length and volume. We can look at vascularity with acoustic angiography. And then we can use a technique called elastography to look at fibrosis in the liver. And then, of course, we can also look at left ventricle cardiac function. And so um, here's an example of tumor segmentation. I still believe that you should pick or choose either prone or supine longitudinally. Um, I mean, we did do comparisons, but I would recommend that you stick with one position. And again, the scan time is less than one minute. You don't need coupling gel, and you get a volumetric readout of your tumor. 
And now you may say, well, how does that happen, right? Because here you're just looking at a coronal plane. But um, this basically shows you the anal analysis software, and it takes about 20 seconds to segment the tumor. And so when you've done your scan, you automatically get the three planes, actual transversal coronal and the 3D reconstruction. And then you will actually, at this point, still manually segment, but we're working on an AI algorithm. And so you will delineate the tumor in one plane. Then you'll verify it in the second plane. And it automatically populates the third plane. And it automatically segments out the tumor in the 3D reconstruction. And it's a good practice to quickly scan through that you have the whole thing. And then you get your volumetric readout. Um, you can say, oh, well, I can do this with calipers. Um, one area, well, A, accuracy, independency of researcher are important criteria to eliminate versus um, caliper. However, also, for example, flat tumors, volumetric readouts, um, there's a huge advantage using this technique. And that's just feedback from the field. Yes, absolutely. And so here's some other validation. We did a lot of validation that's published by my colleague, uh, Tomek Czernisowicz, and um, I can send you the paper if you like, but we did validation against MRI, we did validation about, uh, against calipers, we did validation about, uh, against ex vivo tumors, all that information is available to you. And then, as uh, Dr. Sirkova was alluding to, we can also look at um, orthotopic tumors, pancreas, we have various models. I do think here it's actually advantageous to have co-registration with bioluminescence because these early time points are sometimes hard to discriminate anatomically. And so what you can do is since you're scanning the whole mice or at least that area of interest, you can scan, scan, scan. And if you're not sure whether you're seeing it here, you still have captured the images and that may be very prominent at a later stage and then you can go back and capture the earlier phases. So that's one way of doing it, or co-registering with bioluminescence. So as I was alluding to, we also have vascular contrast with a technique called acoustic angiography. It is proprietary to the company. It's actually our CEO's uh, PhD work, and it's slightly different from microbubbles with other ultrasound um, instruments because we actually excite at a low frequency but we capture the image at high frequency. So we have a very nice high resolution of about 100 micrometers. Since you have to inject microbubbles, it is a longer process because you either need to do a bolus tail vein injection or catheterize the mouse. But the acquisition itself um, is, is about two, three minutes. And this is the lower abdomen of the mouse. And so as an anatomical reference, you can see the iliac arteries. So this is very comparable to what you would get with micro CT. And then um, we've developed some variations on the theme. So we can actually look also at blood vessel density. So this is actually where there is a tumor. The tumor was injected with um, these micro bubbles. And so here we don't have the fine resolution below the 100 micrometers, which is our threshold but still we can collect the total signal of microbubbles, and that gives us a readout for um, blood vessel density. And then we can also look at blood vessel morphology, where we can look at tortuosity of the vessels infiltrating the tumor, and they're developing an algorithm to quantify that. And then, of course, the idea is what do you do with that um, from a therapeutic diagnostic perspective? Um, so here you can actually see there's um, the tumors on day one. You can see the vascularity infiltrating the tumors. The tumors are in blue, yellow is the vessels. And then um, they were either received an ineffective or an effective treatment. And you can clearly see how the vascularity changed with the effective treatment versus the ineffective treatment. So there was a paper actually just recently published by Harvard where they use the technique to screen tumors early on to determine whether the tumors were 
highly vascularized or poorly vascularized. And then they could assign tumors to particular cohorts and evaluate the efficacy of their treatment more accurately. And then switching gears to kidney volume. So this is something that Dr. Katharina Hopp is very interested in. We did a collaborative study with um, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And they have a model for uh, PKD, polycystic kidney disease. And um, traditionally, people use MRI because, you know, it's high resolution, very nice images, highly quantitative. However, um, they would like to serially image to capture more time points and have large cohorts of mice. So therefore, they were looking for an alternative te technology. So clearly, our resolution is not comparable to what you would get with MRI. However, when we quantify kidney volume, you can see that we have a very nice correlation of 0 0.94. And so that's what, what cap captivated the attention for that group. And here you can actually see a video where they're working with these, um, that PKD model. Oh, yeah, okay. So they're delineating the um, kidney to capture the volume. And you can see the cysts, right? They're huge. So this is what we got. Yeah, because they're fluid filled. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's just to show you the quantification again. I don't know how long this goes. And then um, next, you can then, of course, also segment your um, cysts because it's interesting in this disease, the cysts appear and the cysts disappear, and they want to monitor them longitudinally, and so we can segment them out as well. And then... We can use the vascular contrast as well to look at perfusion of the kidneys. Uh, one other advantage um, over conventional ultrasound is the fact that both kidneys are in one field of view. So you don't need to scan kidney, the left kidney first and then the right or vice versa. You can do it in one scan. And then we can look at destruction reperfusion. So this is the fun part about these microbubbles. Microbubbles are air-filled liposomes, and you can burst them. And so you can let, you inject them, they're going in circulation, they're perfusing the entire body. Let's say you're interested in your kidney, and you're looking at the total accumulation of signal in the kidney, and then you can actually burst the bubbles. You send a sound wave, and you burst them, and they collapse, and they disappear. The signal goes away, and then you can measure the time to reperfuse, how, how soon do these um, vessel, uh, micro bubbles show back up? And that gives you an idea of uh, vascularity as well. And that can be done with tumors, with um, liver, anything. And then this is the vascularity of a, a kidney in the rat. And then here on this image, I was nicely surprised, you can actually really well-defined the spleen. So we're starting to work on spleen volumetric measurements, especially for immuno-oncology. Apparently, when you give those um, CAR T-cell treatments, you have a lot of response in the spleen as well. So that's one thought of pursuing that. From a cardiac perspective, again, the advantage here is that you don't need to know what you're doing, basically. You grab your mouse, you... Um, immobilize it with an anesthetic or um, that's that's another point of debate in cardiology is do you do how do you immobilize your mice but that's a different discussion however so you put your mice down you put them belly down we kind of tilt them a little sideways and then uh, we have an AI algorithm that automatically finds the heart because the heart is the fastest moving organ in the body so it can easily be discriminated um, algorithmically. And so once you find the heart, then you can actually, let's see, oops, that was not what I intended. Um, then you can actually find the heart and you can scan the heart. And we can create these um, 4D reconstructions of the heart. And basically what happens is, is um, the probe, the linear array, 
will park itself underneath the heart and collect a 2D movie for a couple of seconds. And then it'll move a little bit further and it'll collect another 2D movie and another 2D movie and another uh, 2D movie throughout the um, axis of the heart. And then um, we can align the phases of these movies and create this um, 4D video. And then once you have that 4D video, you can actually take it to your desk. You don't need to leave your mouse on the stage. You just take that video and you can do M-mode analyses. And then we have an automated M-mode um, analysis algorithm as well. So it measures um, the function of the heart and gives you all these readouts. I'm by no means um, a cardiologist, but that's, that's the concept. And then here you can see another um, analysis that we just recently did. And then um, the readout parameters so we can look at um, ejection fraction, etc. cetera. Um, liver imaging. So liver imaging is very popular because NASH disease, as you know, liver fatty disease is popular these days. And um, so the liver actually is very echo dark and normal healthy liver is quite dark. We can easily see it and then we can look at it in 3D. I'll show you a movie. This is actually a piece of gut interfering with the liver. But then, so as I mentioned, we're doing a lot of NASH studies and then the liver becomes very bright because of the steatosis. So the fat in the liver makes the liver very bright. So first it was very dark, but as you could see in these movies, it's, it becomes very bright. And that's a, a readout parameter for um, the amount of fat, the steatosis in the liver. And so that's very popular. And so here you can see some longitudinal images on coronal sections. So the darker normal liver, and then when we feed a fatty diet to these mice, you can see how it starts becoming much brighter. And then um, one parameter of determining that brightness is called the hepatorenal index. And that's again an advantage of the te technology is that we have both the kidney and the liver in the same field of view, so we can easily determine that ratio. In this case, it's 2.5 in the clinic whoa, you'd be almost dead. <laughs> so <laughs> that's really quite high. Um, but yeah, this is just an illustration and we can measure that early on. And then we can also look at, for example, vessel um, diameters. So not only do we do 3D volumetric imaging, we can also measure distances. And then another thing, so when you're looking at liver disease, it's not just fat in the liver, but it's also fibrosis. And fibrosis is the stiffness of the tissue. So um, this is an analogy with the clinic. We developed a technique called shear wave elastography, which gives you a readout for um, the stiffness of the tissue. So what happens is the more fibrotic the tissue is, the stiffer it is. And you can do this with MRI as well. But what we do is we send sound wave pulses, so we can do it in different locations. And we send these sound wave pulses into the liver. It's kind of like a virtual palpation. And the stiffer the tissue, the faster the propagation. And so we can measure that propagation as a readout for um, elasticity of the tissue and an index for um, fibrosis. And so, um, yeah, this is a scoring of fibrosis. And then this is the um, measurement of elasticity in kilopascals. And then another readout parameter that's important in NASH is uh, vascularity and perfusion. So that can be done with um, the acoustic angiography. And, but right now we haven't pursued that in NASH models per se. But the idea is to be able to derive a multi-parametric assessment of NASH disease non-invasively, which is challenging today because most assessments of staging of the animals is done by biops and histopathology. And usually you can only take one or two biopsies in a tiny little mouse. So again, a non-invasive approach is, is, is very uh, much in demand. 
here's a pregnant rat. So you can see the babies, and you can size them. You can look at an individual baby. Um, this is an image of the a rat, but this is a smaller rat, right? Last, I think it was two weeks ago, we scanned 600 gram rats, and that was, that was a challenge. But they were so cute. They were like pets. They were sitting in my arm. They were really sweet. So um, we do some um, muscle regeneration as well, sarcopenia imaging. Again, here, it's almost a good example of a very flat tumor. Um, but this is a muscle segmented out and for volumetric measurements of muscle. And then um, what we're developing now is a needle-guided injection. So in this case, we're injecting a payload in the bladder, but this could be the pancreas. It could be anywhere, like we were talking thyroid just a minute ago. So um, the great advantage of the technique, and in this case, we will have an accessory um, that has somewhat handheld probe because we need to align the probe with the needle, right? And the beauty of the technique here is that we have an automatic co-registration of the angle of the needle and the angle of the beam. But that will be a handheld accessory. And so here you can see it in action. There is the needle, right? And this is um, the bladder. And then, yeah, you can basically see. And then we have the animation here to make it a little cle uh, easier to visualize. So the needle is quite bright. But yeah, that's the idea. And so you can inject, but you can, of course, also use it for biopsies. And then, um, as I mentioned, we're developing the strata. And the strata is co-registering optical, for now, bioluminescence only, um, with the ultrasound. So the beauty there is clearly the sensitivity of um, luciferase where we can detect it before it can be anatomically um, appreciated. And of course, also um, the anatomical co-registration with the ultrasound. So for now, we're doing bioluminescence only, but then we're, work we're thinking about photoacoustics as well as um, fluorescence imaging. So that's in the works. So nothing much here, but I mean, it's kind of like if you would have the Vega side by side with the IVIS. The advantage here is that you don't have to take the mouse out of one instrument and put it in the other. Of course, at this point, it's 2D only, so, but we're working on 3D reconstruction as well. And with no further ado, I would like to thank you for your attention, and questions are welcome. Yes, the liver is actually a very nice organ to visualize with ultrasound. As you say, lung is problematic with ultrasound because the air interferes with the sound waves, and so is bone. So we cannot image in the skull. We cannot, at least not with this technique, and we cannot image in the lungs, and bone is also problematic. You can actually see the shadows, like when you see the kidneys. It's like you have a left kidney and a right kidney, and there's nothing in the middle because that's where the spine is. <laughs> it shadows and shows up dark on the image. So. But if you put it like uh, bone, then it Yeah, you can. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. But like the way you position for the heart, the sternum will also interfere and may shadow the right ventricle, so that's more challenging than imaging the left ventricle, and um, I think Maria can probably uh, give some more information on that. But that's where positional effects do matter to a certain extent. So do you know what's the minimal size of the uh, liver mass that you have to see? Yeah, comfortably we can say 20 cubic millimeters. So that's again where you excel. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's, it's my it's so yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And as I was alluding to, you can take your scans early on and you may not be sure of what you're seeing, but then once you see it, you go back and, and then you look at your earlier images and then you have more clarity. Or you co-register with BLI because BLI has such a high sensitivity that you can just detect a couple of cells. But you need to transduce your cells, you need to inject luciferin, and this is basically contrast agent-free unless we go to vascular imaging. So yeah, there's still not one magical technique out there, although MRI probably comes close. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't dwell on the cardiac applications. It's really a talk on its own where you look at B modes and M modes and this and that, and it gets, it gets really fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning a lot myself still. I only knew ultrasound to prec check horses and cows and to look at tendons of horses. That was my limitation with ultrasound. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that was pretty much it. So it was, but that was 20 years ago when I was exposed to that. So, so the frequency of the probes here, the highest we have is 35 megahertz at this point. So, Maria. So when you were describing the fighting fever. Yeah. So I got it to also the general. Mm -hmm. So how does all the elastography will differentiate the bit of fat? You're, the... you're right on. And I have an entire talk on that subject because we have a lot of industry um, uh, interest in that application. And in my opinion, we have to go multi-parametric. And so I want to look at fat, I want to look at fibrosis, I want to look at perfusion, and I want to look at inflammation. So I want to use a chemiluminescent inflammation probe and see what we need. And you'll have to basically phenotype your model so that you can identify. Because some of these mice, like the Western fat diet mice, it takes a while because they, before they become fibrotic. But I can show you some of the data. And the interference actually is more so um, the inflammation because the inflammation enhances the tissue stiffness as well. You know, like if you have like a mosquito bite, it feels pretty stiff because it's inflamed and it swells and it's fluid filled, right? So what we see when we look at these studies longitudinally is we see steatosis, then we see inflammation, and then we see fibrosis. But the inflammation gives a hop in the elastography, and then it goes down, and then it becomes fibrotic. We do comparison with histopathology, right? And then it goes back up. So I can show you some of that data afterwards. So yeah, we're very fascinated. So, hmm, it's a good question. We can do it on tumors, but anywhere where it's going to be fluid-filled, it's going to be a problem because the fluid bounces it back, right? So the PKD, no. Other kidney diseases, fibrotic kidney disease, yes. The heart, no, it moves too fast. So we're developing strain analyses for, for the heart. But that's still under development. Huh? Um, well, I've been... <laughs> thinking about it, but it's challenging with, with the air, you know? So, um, but that would be a very nice application, but you have the micro CT for that. And I think fibrosis in the lungs with micro CT, I don't know, would be my go-to modality. If you have all the bells and whistles and you can choose them, this and that, yeah. Exactly. No.
Yeah, we're hoping for the strain analysis in, in the heart, so that's, that's our ambition. Yes? You, you nicely showed abdominal imaging, liver imaging, heart yeah. imaging. How about the neck? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't done much there, but we were just talking about thyroid imaging, so I think that would be very appropriate to explore. It's just we're, we're a small company, and we have, we're basically kind of reactive in what people ask us, and then we're like, oh, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> Ship us some mice, and, and let's image for you. So I'm thinking head and neck tumors is definitely an area that we should explore Thank you. Interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking so, but we have, I mean, we, we would um, need to empirically test it, but I, I'm assuming it's soft tissue. It should, it should work, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. No, it'd be interesting to look at for sure. Yes. Yes. So that's why we do recommend, like, when you get a new model. I personally like to evaluate how I'm going to position. Am I going to use gel? Am I going to use water? What probe am I going to use? So you do want to spend a little bit of investigative time initially to determine that. <laughs> because um, the way it happens is the sound waves lose, uh, lose energy with depth. And so that's why if you use a higher frequency probe, you have just about a centimeter depth penetration, so then you want to probably flip-flop your mouse. So I should have probably put the slide up where I have an image on, on the supine side and an image from the prone side. I think that would be helpful. It's a good idea. I'll put that in the slide deck. <laughs> Other questions, ideas for applications? Yeah. Yeah, no, we actually dappled with that at the demo we had two weeks ago to look at. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a good point because you can also use it for, for example, gene delivery. When I was with Perkinelmer, we would actually put a luciferase tag on the gene, and then we could look at the molecular expression of the gene with the optical, but we could target the delivery with the microbubbles because you burst them in the organ of interest. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a great idea. And then even maybe with the needle-guided injection, you can even refine things, right? So... Yeah, the needle guided injection is going to be a lot of fun too, I think, actually. So. Yeah, the Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.